In this episode, we speak to Wine Director General Manager Michael Mahler of Vin Rouge, of which he reveals his secrets on how to get hired at the top restaurants, how he builds one of the best wine programs in North Carolina, and the value of collecting aged wine and verticals. Later, Max brings up an embarrassing moment being interviewed by Chef Matt Kelly and Michael Mahler, all on the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. You're listening to the NCF&B Podcast, part of the OG Podcast Network. The NCF&B Podcast takes you behind the scenes of North Carolina's food and beverage industry. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at NCFB Pod. This episode sponsored in part by Food Scene. That's food, S-E-E-N, dot com. Providing professional photography, social media management, video production, and website design. And now, enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to the NC FMB podcast. I am your co-host Max Trujillo, and I am your co-host Matthew Weiss, and we are coming to you from a beautiful morning in Durham, North Carolina, and the hallowed grounds of French cuisine here at a restaurant called Ban Rouge with the general manager and beverage director, Mister Michael the Mauler Maller. Oh, I knew you'd go there. <laughs> I had to, but. I think I got the actual pronunciation yeah. right for once. You did. You nailed it. Thank you for I've, that. Uh, no, I've been bastardizing your name uh, yeah. publicly and privately for yeah. a long time. So. Well, I've attacked you about it. So. Yeah, no, it, so as wait, you should. <laughs> say your name correctly. Maller. Michael Maller. Maller. Not like going to the mall. Not yeah. like Norman or, Maller. Or, no, or Maller. This has been a conversation of no that Matt and I have had off, off mic. Like, yeah. It's Mike Maller, I think. No, no it's Mike Mailer. No, it's... Mike Maller. <laughs> I'm already wrong. I already yeah. got it wrong now. Yeah. Norman Mailer's in today, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I might as say, thank you so much. Uh, so Michael has uh, procured, he's been decanting for the last three hours, a 2005 <laughs> Domaine Romani Conti for us so that nice. we're yeah. about to enjoy and discuss wine as it ages. We figured... Open like a twenty thousand dollar bottle of wine. Yeah. It's not a big deal. Yeah, thank with, with you. With our coffee and oysters, there's nothing better than DRC. Yeah, <laughs> Matt knows a little something about that. Uh, Never with oysters, but yeah. Yeah. Well, but thank you. Uh, this is fun for us, not only to just get out of the studio uh, and just pick a place, not just any old place, but yeah, as Matt said before, kind of the hallowed grounds of French cuisine in Durham wow. and such great history of people that have that have cooked in this place, even. Servers that have worked here have gone on to be yeah. pretty well known in this business, yeah. and um, yeah, it's just fun to be here. So uh, I can't wait for all the you know the food to just start coming in as as we dine. <laughs> yeah, it's been a fun uh, fun run. Uh, you know, Van Rouge, you know, you call it hallowed ground. I don't know about that, but it's definitely an awesome place to to work and spend a lot of my time. And, and, well, and, well, it is. I mean, l- let's give and, this place and you your just due. So for our listeners who might not know you, and you're one of like the I, I guess it's like in a subtle way because you're not like boastful or anything but you're one of the top wine professionals in the area for sure maybe in the southeast and um well, running you know program at van rouge running the program the wine program at mateo's and you and we'll get into it later but built this incredible sherry program um to the point where food and wine magazine recognized that place for being one of the best places to drink wine in america and back in 2012 yeah, that was crazy yeah yeah um you've been written about by new york times eric asimov rec- recognized your programs uh and then now just recently you opened up st james which is exclusively a seafood seafood joint so you know you're pretty awesome man well and, and it's pretty <laughs> cool and just one more thing Thank before you. that like you came back to this area in 2005, which, uh, when was it that Durham was named best food city in the South? That was like three years ago, four years ago, something like uh, that? No, yeah, yeah. It's been since Mateo's open, so at least since 2012. So 2012. 2012, 13, 14, somewhere around there. So even so, way before back then, you were really pushing the envelope here at Van Rouge. Well, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't even think I really realized what the envelope was at the time. Uh, I know that it was, 
it was definitely different than it is now. The area has grown a lot. What we have access to, yeah, as far as wine and and booze and beer. I mean, it's all so much cooler than it was then. Um, and it was it was cool then. It was there was great stuff, but there's there was less to choose from. Right. You know. But you were still able to. I mean, this place this place has been open since when? Because you came back in two thousand five, but it had already been yeah. open for. Yeah, I started January of two thousand five. It opened February two thousand two. Okay, so I had about three years um, before I had ever even heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> and was Matt Kelly the chef at the time? Yeah, Matt started. Um, I, I th- Neither of us can really ever figure it out, but we think it's around six months before I started, like sure. mid to late 2004. Okay. And you guys have had a bromance ever since. Oh, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're, we're cute. <laughs> well, let's get, let's get back into you. Uh, tell us where, where you're from. I uh, grew up in New York on Long Island. Oh, uh, and here we Long go. Long Island. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, what, part of, what part of Long Island are you from? Uh, a little village called Nisquag in Smithtown. <laughs> Uh, oh. And I never thought I had an. Accent. Do you know where that is, Matt? Yeah, we're kind of out there, Smithtown. It's like halfway out. But um, but yeah, but uh, Greg Harrington was from Smithtown. Is from. Oh is really? From, yeah. Wow, oh, wow, they they yeah. pump out some wine wine geeks out there yeah, in Smithtown. Apparently. Yes, I, I mean, I didn't, who I don't knew? Think I knew what wine was then. But I mo- I moved to North Carolina in tenth grade. I was not quite sixteen to Wilmington. Oh wow! Okay. And uh, you know, worked in restaurants. Once I started working, I don't think I've ever had another job except for. One summer, I was sweeping, sweeping the floors at a sporting goods store. Uh, other than that, it's all been restaurants. Ooh, let's get into that. Screw yeah. all this wine yeah. talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Max was doing the same thing, sweeping the floors at a tennis shop. I was, yeah, I worked at a tennis mm-hmm. shop for four years. Fine. But, <laughs> <laughs> but aside from that, uh, so what got you into, um, I mean, I don't know, was it by accident that you picked up this knowledge of wine or you just always been into no nah, so like you know i was a waiter and i knew that like the more i knew about wine the more i'd sell and the more money i'd make and it was as simple as that yeah. and uh you know they would have like little contests and i would i'd win them sometimes and and that was cool and then i moved from waiting tables at this this one place uh to managing being an assistant manager of another and after being there for a couple of weeks the owner's like you know anything about wine and i'm like uh yeah i guess you know like it, yeah, I know a little bit, and I thought I did. And I thought I knew, you know, fair amount. I was like, all right, we need a new wine list. You got ten days. Wow. And this is a place that it's an institution in, in Wilmington, North Carolina, but uh, wasn't known for its wine program. Like our wines by the glass. When I started, we had you know, uh, Vendange was like our oh, premium geez. pour whites in right. We had like wait, what place is this for people that because we have a lot of listeners it's in a, Wilmington. Uh, Roy's Riverboat Landing. It actually just closed after uh, being. Uh, been open for 34 35 years oh wow um i was there for four and a half and i realized now like that they close and we're open for that long like how insignificant is that um but you know i uh he gave me 10 days and i was like well can i have 30 yeah so he gave me 30 days to make a new wine list and and i made what i thought was like the coolest dopest (laughs) wine list in town you know um what at that time was something edgy to you that maybe wasn't happening in Wilmington that you were bringing to that table? Well, I mean, there was no, there, it wasn't even a, a thought in my mind to do something that wasn't brought there. It wasn't like this idea of getting someone to source something or bring something in. It just, it whatever. wasn't, it wasn't a thing. It was just whatever's available and, and whatever's kind of being pushed on you at the time and like weeding my way through that. And, but I didn't realize that wasn't like the only way. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I remember we had stuff like, uh, what was what was something cool like Vega Cecilia, mm. right? Oh, yeah, okay. You know, and stuff we have in Mateo right now. You know, sure. great wine, good stuff. Uh, you know, but a wine that had you know had some age on it, right? And this was like in 1998, and I probably had like I'm guessing like 92 or three on the list or something like that, which yeah, you know, yeah. it was yeah. exciting, right? I'm wondering what what was the uh, owner's impetus at the time to say, okay, we've been pouring Vendage, I think we need an upgrade. Like, did he just see the the value in that. I, I think at, at, at the time he'd been open for 15 years or whatever and realized he'd been doing the same thing and other places are not and yeah. it's time and he you know he doesn't have time to do it all but now he's like maybe for the first time he had an assistant manager and in addition to a general manager and he found you probably were enthusiastic yeah. about yeah. wine yeah he, he probably, probably yeah maybe yeah. he already saw it in me I don't know like I was selling wine yeah. well, when you were a kid yeah. too I mean that's 
20 years ago, and we're not that far apart. Yeah, but I'm age. old. I thought that's why you wanted to talk about age stuff today. It's because like <laughs> I'm literally like the oldest person who you, buys wine and yeah, because you were me, you were already like working this harvest when this vintage of right. age <laughs> is in front of us. <laughs> Uh, no, but so, so that's cool because you have such a perspective from Wilmington, but then, uh, and then you moved to New York. Yeah, I moved to New York. Um, so my fiance at the time had plans to go to CIA and, uh, I was like, well, I want to go to culinary school too then. Yeah. You know, like that sounds cool. And, you know, at the time I thought I, I wanted to have my own place and I had only ever been in the front of the house except for, uh, lucky enough to spend, uh, summer washing dishes at, uh, uh, little fried seafood shack other than that it was it was just front of the house and i didn't know anything about cooking whatever and i was like well if i'm gonna want to have my own place one day i really should learn Mm. more about it and learn how to cook whatever so talked about going to cia for a minute and i was like what about this place in new york city new york city's cooler yeah you know uh and we can work in like awesome restaurants and so we ended up going to the fci french culinary it's not even called that anymore but yeah, now it's ice, right? I think. Well, no, it's or they uh, no. There's there's two. There's ice, which is like international culinary education or something like that, and then the um, I can't remember. It's something. It sounds like that culinary center, international culinary center. I think is what FCI okay. is because it stopped being just French and added Italian and then some Asian cuisines, and now it's you know yeah. completely global. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so yeah, and, and then in New York, you did work in some super cool restaurants. Yeah, you know, I, there was one place I, I wanted to work. Um, you know, I know there's like 25,000 restaurants there, but I was like, I really want to work at this place, Grammar's Tavern. I'd been there once, um, you know, had done a lot of reading about it just because couldn't not. It was, it was kind of popping up everywhere and food magazines and stuff. And what I remembered about going out to eat there and, and, and ordering wine versus like other fancy restaurants in New York was like, there wasn't a sommelier. It was, it was our, our regular waiter. And I didn't even realize they were called captains and whatever. And like just selling us wine. And I was like, that, that's really cool. Um, and I think I can learn a lot about, about wine by just like, having to do it and not working yeah. at, so I wanted to work at like a fancy place. Uh, I don't know why, but like that was like New York city, like it has this kind of thing that like doesn't exist where I'm living now and in Wilmington and, and, uh, it's cosmopolitan. Yeah. And it's glamorous. Yeah, yeah. yeah of and uh, but the idea of of not having a sommelier, but there was you know a world renowned beverage program, and, yeah. and it was really the service that was that drew me to it, um, the the hospitality end of things, you know, and like you can at that point, it was two thousand two, like already hearing about Danny Meyer, and it's like hospitality, not like you do now, but. Yeah, um, and was Calicchio still the chef? At the yeah. Time? yeah, yeah, yeah. That he was, was my question. Yeah, who was cooking? He was. So, did he have hair at the time? More than that. yeah, yeah, he had, he had a little bit. Yeah, just hanging on. I love it. seeing but, the old pictures of him with hair. Even at that point, though, he wasn't super hands on. Like he wasn't he was on race. the on the pass. Yeah, every night, kind of thing. You know, like he had a chef de cuisine, Johnny Schaefer, I think was his name, who was badass and 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 ran that kitchen. Yeah. So Max, I don't have you ever been to Gramercy Tavern? No, so uh, we have to go. I, I was we're uh, we gotta go when we're up. There. Yeah, we're heading up to New York in a couple of weeks to do a, a side project separate, uh, actually for my family's fundraiser. We're making a video and doing some stuff for that. But uh, yeah, we gotta go because that bar it's definitely my, still my favorite place to drink wine in New York City. You got yeah. like almost thirty wines by the glass. You could choose. You can do a three ounce pour, a six ounce pour. Yeah, yeah I think it, they might even have a nine ounce pour. Plus they have like you can the, get whatever pour you want. Yeah, thing. Is exactly. You know, and the, just, even just nice. and as you say, even the bartenders there are so knowledgeable about the wines. It's just yeah. so much fun to have a conversation yeah. with them. Yeah. That, that tavern room where the bar is is one of my favorite places yeah. in the world. I mean, it's just it feels so good and smells so good, and there's like everything tastes so good. Like it's it's just fun. When it comes to vodka, it starts at the farm. Social House Vodka sources corn locally from a farmer who plants non-GMO corn. And because it's made from corn, it's also gluten-free. Social House Vodka comes from Kenston, North Carolina and sources water from the ancient Black Creek Aquifer. Social House Vodka. Live socially. Enjoy responsibly. So let me ask you, so you are now working uh, at what many people consider kind of like the top of your game. Like that's, that's like when Inez Rubistello was working at Windows of the World, it, it, you know, the World Trade Center. Yeah. There was arguably very few places to go beyond that. I right. mean, you're kind of at, at the top of your game. So now were you like filled with all this like, you know, confidence no. and arrogance even and no, ego? Because, 
not it, it was the opposite. Let me go down to North Carolina and show them what a thing or two. It was the opposite because like I went there thinking like I knew about stuff and like yeah. how to work in restaurants and knew about wine and like and then like literally my first night there were tasting blind during lineup, which I had never done a single time in yeah. my life. And people are like debating about whether it's Barolo or Barbaresco and is it, you know, 93 or 95 yeah. it's not 94 and you're like and i'm what just the like fuck? i yeah. think it's red wine and i'm like yeah exactly like <laughs> you know yeah how would one so even you know say ne- ne- nebbiolo like what is that yeah. you know like yeah and uh so that was an eye opener <laughs> and it was a lip closer like i was just like yeah. zip you know like i didn't I didn't. Like, How speak did you even get the job there? Like so through I, FCI or no, no, no. Uh, so well, you know, calling in favors. Um, mm. I uh, already had a relationship at that time with Andre Tamers. You guys yeah. know Andre from Damis on Selections. Of course. So he, I guess, had just started his company a couple couple years before that. Uh, well, no, at that point, at that point, several years before that, because he's. Uh, I don't know, six years or so. Um, and he was already, you know, making a name for himself and doing a lot of business in New York. Yeah. And, and I asked him, I'm like, you know anybody at Gramercy Tavern? And he's like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm friends with Paul Greco, the wine buyer there. Yeah. And I was like, well, I want to work there. He's like, all right, well, let me, you mean, let me let, at least get you to talk to him. I, I can do that. I can, I can get you a conversation. And uh, so, he, you know, he gave me the, you know, contact info. I guess it was, you know, no one really had cell phones or whatever, like calling the restaurant and, you know, little phone tag back and forth, and finally I get to talk to Paul. And uh, I didn't know when I was moving up there. I just knew at some point we we were going in the next few months. And we ended up having to postpone our our trip up. And during that time that Paul and I started talking, at the time I actually got there, he had moved on yeah. to open hearth. And I was just like, no, <laughs> like no, this is not good. Because uh, I really, really wanted to work there. Like the more I thought about it, like the more excited I became about the opportunity. And, and yeah, everything. and you want to work with him too. And the, yeah. yeah, and the and exactly yeah, and the, and the the more I thought about that place, like the less cool everywhere else in the city seemed. And so then I find out I'm bummed. I call Andre. I'm like, Yo, Paul Greco's not there anymore. You know anybody else? And he's like, Yeah, I know. You know the guy's doing the wine now is actually the general manager, Nick Montone. But I don't really have a relationship with him. But I was like, all right, well, at least I can mention him. Like, what's his favorite wine to buy from you? So he told me. He's like, nice. Roth Lantora uh, Priorat. I forget which, which cuvee it was. I'm like, all right, cool. So I managed to, you know, get an interview there. Um, not with Nick, but with one of the assistant managers. And then that was it. I didn't hear anything for, seemed like forever. And it was probably just days. Mm. And I called, you know, I was persistent, dropped by. Uh, eventually got another interview with somebody and then like t- all the time's going by meanwhile I'm living in New York City I don't have a job Ooh. right and we're you know, like Bank account <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I take a job somewhere else finally like I'm like alright where else do I want to work This and I, I end up starting uh, at Artisanal oh. which was like exciting for like you know cheese yeah. right and uh, and I had trained three or four nights there and Grandma's Tavern called and I got this interview with Nick Montone and and uh, and they offered me the job, but I got to bring up, you know, somehow dropped in line, like, oh, drinking this pre rot Brooklyn Tora, <laughs> nice. whatever. And yeah, I saw his eyes light up, you know. Like, so that That's might, that such a smart help. way, by yeah. the way, to, uh, I mean, in anything, when you're networking, to find out a little bit, of, it was such a smart question of, like, finding out what the guy likes, finding out other information. It's like, yeah. Uh, giving away trade secrets, but, yeah. well. Someone just, wants to be an intern on this show, they're like, yeah, you know, I do remember watching that one game, uh, Charles Woodson and uh, playing tuck, for the Raiders. Don't bring up the tuck roll ever to Max. <laughs> no, because yeah. you can bring it up and say, eh, oh. it was clearly a fumble. Oh, man. yeah. Clearly like, a fumble. Hired. Dude, I want that guy around me at all times. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, you know, like it's the it's the old, uh, not a trick, but a uh, tip of the trade that the one thing I learned very early on is, um, you know, Sam Smith, who wrote this book about Michael Jordan called The Jordan Rules, mm-hmm. like a kind of a confident. It's the story that the first question Everybody would talk to Michael Jordan and be like, man, that shot that you hit in North Carolina or like, you know, the, oh, man, 63 points. But like Sam Smith, the first question he asked, how's your golf game looking? You know, or like, you know, how, yeah. w- how many putts did you have in the last round? You know, and like once he did that, Jordan's eyes just lit up. So he like really trusted him and could talk to him about golf. Well, Matt, you, you coached me up on that when we first decided to do the show. Matt was like, yeah, dude, when we interview people, this is totally behind the curtain, but 
I think it's kind of funny. It's like, we interview people. Let's not just ask people all the things that everyone's always been asked. Let's find out some other things and then maybe throw them for a loop. And you gave that example to me. You're like, let's try to find that question yeah. with everybody we ever interview. Is like, uh, let's what's, find something. What's coming? What's the question? <laughs> Boxers or briefs? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just, why do you make any assumptions at all? <laughs> Good point. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Good point. Yeah. So we, we don't have any of them. It, it would have been nice if we had a Sam Smith question. All I know is, yeah. save me, <laughs> won't you? Oh, I need. Oh, God. That's another that's, Sam Smith. That's a different Smith. guy, yeah. right? Oh, okay. That's a different Sam Smith. Oh, okay. Max is going to sing for you later. Um, <laughs> no, singing for me now. I like it. Just, 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 All right, just let's, let's move to that. present no. time. Let's get Yeah, let's, let's, let's move, move to present time. present time. So what made you guys leave New York City and come back? Well, originally just planned on staying there for a year. You know, French Culinary Institute, the... Culinary program is just a one-year program, which is another thing that made it cool versus CIA to me. Um, and after that year of like literally not having Wait, a so day you were doing the or your wife was doing. We're both were. She went, both were yeah, and working she at went, the same time. She, Gwen was going for pastry. Yeah, and I was going for like just classic French and and working. So between work and school, like I almost literally didn't have days off. Yeah, because at Gramercy Tavern, you're probably working doubles. Because it's open for well, yeah, well, I was working. I didn't have many nights available uh, that first year because mm-hmm. I was going to school at night. That was three nights a week. So I was working mostly lunches with some dinners to gotcha. start, and um, which was like the coolest thing, like working lunches. I'm like, you're still making money. Still making money and like yeah. still selling like awesome wine, like not just like glasses, but like bottles of like Batar Marche at lunch. And like it was just mind-blowing yeah but so after that first year we're like was, was coming to a close we're like you know we should we should stay another year and, and just work and and play and go out and like really experience new york because otherwise yeah. we might as well have not really been in new york except for to go to school and work in new york yeah so we did uh we stayed another year and that was that was really incredible so during that year uh i stopped working at Grammar's tavern i got to start working uh at per se um in the kitchen as an externship from school, even though I had already graduated, they were hiring oh, wow. externs for you know free labor and stuff in the kitchen, and that's not why. Uh, but um, so I felt, you know, Gwen's like, you have to do this. She saw it, and you have to do it, and I applied for it and so got you did it. A year per se. No, 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 no. So that was just a few months, and oh, then okay. from there I moved so on. That was before the fire. I started there right. The fire? You started the fire? <laughs> <laughs> no. So they had the fire, um, and then they closed for yeah. uh, months, I think. Yeah. Um, and just before they reopened is when I started. Mm. So they they kind of like lost all their externs at that point and started with a new crop. Really? Right. Right. So I got I got lucky to, to that cool. the place caught fire in the walls. Um, but that was just around three or four months of you know. Shucking fava beans and, and doing all stuff like at six in the morning, uh, and I was so thankful that I did it in the summer. Was Andre there? Uh, yeah, Andre, we did overlap. Andre Mac. I didn't get to like meet people. Like yeah. I really didn't. Like I was like in the back back of the kitchen, like early and working and like oh yeah. it would meet like in passing, but I didn't I didn't know who he yeah. was or who anybody was. And <laughs> that was one thing I really wish was was better or I had done better was made a point to to meet meet more of those people that I wasn't like working closely with. Um, and there was, there was a lot of separation between the front and back there, which I wish was different, but it's kind of the old school way of restaurants. I mean, I think that's, yeah. that's the way it's yeah. always been up until probably more recent where there yeah. seems to be a more blurred line, which yeah. I, I like, I, I enjoy the fact that I, I also think that, you know, bartending and sommeliers and front of the house staff are much more involved in the culinary aspect of, of things as opposed to simply knowing uh, service technique, because mm-hmm. I think that's it's just education. Maybe right. with food shows and all that, it makes everyone sure. in, into it. But but there's definitely a bigger blend now uh, to make a generalization. I feel that's yeah, no, totally heads right. in that direction yeah. more. I think people who own restaurants or chefs are are making a decided effort to blend that because they know it's only better for business yeah. camaraderie of a restaurant. One yeah, team, one no, dream. you want to you want to know the people you're working with. Yeah. You know, like and because they're probably pretty cool. And every line, yeah. <laughs> every totally. line yeah, cook listening to this, like you, Justin, yeah, I'm talking to you. It's probably like, yeah, yeah. Um, it'd be also be really cool if all those servers would share those tips with us. That'd be right. sweet. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. True. But yeah. uh, so from there, I moved on. I, uh, after my externship was done, I wanted, I wanted to cook a little bit. Um, I still thought I wanted to cook. Um, went to culinary school, was cooking, and I went to craft. 
and was working Garmanger there. Oh, good old Tom. But then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I got to work with Tom again. And he was like, why, why are you here? Why are you doing this? Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, explain to him. He's like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah good luck. <laughs> and just, he, did he hire you? For, for no, that, no, no. He didn't hire me. Uh, but, you know, I met him when I was going up to sign some paperwork with HR or whatever. He was in his office and he didn't said hello. But um, no, that only lasted a few months because then it was time to move back yeah. to okay. North Carolina. So, Yes, you know well, how was I got there, here. Was there a reason to move back, or are you oh, like? Yeah, because we wanted to have uh, a house and a yard and dogs and kids, yeah. and uh, you know, like a, lot story, of, a lot, of, a lot, a lot of people can do that there, but it didn't seem like right for us. Right. Um, so we wanted to move back home to North Carolina, and um, at that point, like the idea of moving back to Wilmington after being exposed to like the restaurant scene in New York was not an option. Yeah. You know, it was the restaurant scene in Wilmington is different than it is today, and and. Uh, so and that's still there in here. Happy meeting. Yeah, Gwen's from Chapel Hill, mm. um, her, and she's got lots of family here. We have lots of family here, um, and so moved to Chapel Hill, and called Andre again. Said, "I need, I need to work." <laughs> you know, he's like your booking agent. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. You know, yeah. and for people that don't, by the way, we should have Andre on the show. Yeah, like, right. Yeah, his company's based in Chapel Hill, and uh, I don't know him that well. I've met him a couple times, but. Uh, what I do know of him is that his trips are absolutely legendary. Oh, man. I, I got to go on the first uh, Sherry Camp, he calls it. Yeah. Uh, in 2011, leading up to the opening of Mateo. That was awesome. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, his trips are legendary. Like, it just he really thinks of everything. Not just, like, you get to meet these people and check out the vineyards and taste the wine and everything. But, like, immerse yourself in the culture a little bit. And, and he just makes it fun and... Uh, provides cool places to stay like super cool places yeah and just like everything he puts a lot of thought and care into it and, and takes good care of people um but yeah i called him and uh he's like well this guy giorgio has a bunch of restaurants and and my friend ken is the beverage director um this was ken Rosati. i don't know if you guys know ken he's not in the business anymore but he um was doing that hired me well, he didn't hire me but uh i met with him before i took the job um and uh you took the job as a as a general manager oh, here okay yeah um and you know got to work with this guy ken who you mentioned inez when he was in the world he was inez's boss there oh wow yeah, you know yeah. what that's why i've heard his name because yeah. i remember in research that yeah. sounded familiar to me yeah, yeah. um his is awesome and he eventually you know left being beverage director for these restaurants and and opened a distributorship called chenterba selections huh. which was huge we were buying most of our wine at van rouge from him Okay. Uh, like way more than anybody else by far. And then when it came to the time for him to close his business, and he called me, I panicked. I was like, whoa, like I've got way too many chickens and <laughs> what is it? Too many eggs in one basket. Yeah. And uh, so I've learned like, don't, don't do that. Well, yeah, except <laughs> for Kellogg's selection. You know, all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> okay. Don't worry about it. Well, let, me ask you, <laughs> let me ask you though. So from what I gather, you were a server for a long time. You went to school as a... As a as a cook or chef, you were getting culinary uh, education, and then you were at you're also in the kitchen at Per Se for a while. Yeah, so I skipped. And then some you stuff. just well, then you just became a general manager at Vin Rouge. Mm-hmm. No, like, so no. So, how did no, that? No, I skipped over some stuff. So I was a server for a while. Then I became an assistant manager at that place where the guys like you got ten days. Okay. It didn't take long until I was a general manager there. Oh, okay. So so you've then, been so in I was, management. I was for a while. general manager. Yeah. Before I moved to New York. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a little bit more perspective, I guess, yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, people always like kind of wonder the building blocks of something and like, wait a minute, how'd that guy just now he's running everything? It's like, oh, yeah. Well, you did pay your dues and yeah. you, you yeah. kind of raised your hand back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, no, I, mean I, I had waited tables in a bunch of places. Um, he was like, you know, one of the places I was waiting tables, I was like promoted to uh, like a shift leader, right? We, we, or the manager would work like, from 11 to 9 but there'd be like a server who would like manage the opening and another server to manage the closing and I was like one of the few people who got to do that and then I became the assistant manager of this other place and general manager and plus when you worked at the Bramercy Tavern and you're a captain you're kind of like the manager of your section you're actually Very managing a lot so. of people like you have a back waiter you have a bus you know the bus yeah. boy and, and yeah. all the type of things Very so much so. it really sets you up for management yeah, yeah except I think for so. you're not coding invoices I mean, and doing yeah. the schedule yeah. and yeah, and you're being managed at as well, you know, yeah. Yeah. but but sure. I mean, it definitely helps help prepare me for that. Yeah. Uh, All right. So cut to cut to Van Rouge. Yeah. Uh, I, I am curious because at that. By the way, is that is that gonna 
affect the sound. Um, I don't know, listeners. Are you I, can, I, can you hear those leaf blowers in the yeah. background? That's fine. Okay, we got to clean I, the place up because we, 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 we can. No, no, no. We can postpone good. that to later if we need to. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, okay. Um, so back to Van Rouge. Uh, it's 2005. Yeah. You know, uh, we're not on the cusp of the culinary revolution quite yet, but uh, you've met this place already managed to carve out a niche in the Durham market, I guess, based on the the quality of people from the education from Duke and the medical profession yeah. already. Well, yeah, well, it started with a with a bang. You know, Giorgio Bakshaw opened it in 2002. He had already had a name for himself. Had opened a lot of restaurants around, or several restaurants around here already. Had one right across the street called George's Garage and Parazod right down the road. Yeah. Others around the, the area. Um, and it opened with lots of excitement, although it was a crazy time for him to open. It was... Uh, February 2002, which is just a few months after 9 11, mm. and like Freedom Fries and all that. And, yeah. And here we are opening this, here he, here he was opening this French restaurant. French restaurant yeah. But it started super busy. Um, and I don't know that the place had a, a full identity, uh, knew exactly what it wanted to be. Um, and there were, you know, several or a few chefs and several managers for those first few years. Um, and it started really busy, and then it wasn't so busy here after that, and then it was a lot less busy here after that. It was like really slow. Uh, and then, you know, Matt Kelly started. Um, and I think the place at, at some point got to the point where it, it, it wasn't great. Mm-hmm. Um, and Matt started and, you know, really focused on, on riding the ship, and, and, and has, you know, he was able to. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, you know, sort of really focusing on product and you know conscientiousness and you yeah. know, all these things, and uh, and then I started a few months after that, and I had no idea uh, what I was getting myself into because we were really slow. I remember my first night here was a Saturday night, and it was crazy. I had been into several interviews with Giorgio and his partner Jay, and uh, and I was finally gotten to the point where I was like, man, if they don't give me the, offer me the job today, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them, you know kiss my ass or something like that because like it's a lot of interviews right yeah but they they had all these other ideas for me and thought that i should be a chef at one of their restaurants and like crazy things to think about like did i would even oh i would do uh, it right i hate those <laughs> interviews where it's like you don't know exactly what job yeah. you're going for like yeah. you go in so many ways yeah. yeah yeah um and then so i'm at this interview and in my mind like if i don't get off of the job then i'm not i'm just gonna move on and 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 find think about something one. else right and so they do offer me a job, and, and Jay was like, okay, so go ahead, go get started. And I was like, uh, okay, you know, uh, all right. So I called Gwen. I'm like, uh, I'm not coming home tonight. I've got a job now. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll see you later. <laughs> oh, you know? wow. Like, you know? uh, so I came in, you know, working. It was a Saturday night, and it was really slow. Uh. It was, you know, January, wintertime. Yeah. Might have been a few flurries or something like that. But I remember we did 19 covers. 19 people came in. <laughs> yeah, and I, like now, like, if we have a server on a Saturday night that does less than 19 covers, I'm like, what is going on? Yeah. You know, yeah. like, what's happening? Uh, Sidebar, I always love watching on uh, Instagram your feed uh, of, of your pocket trash. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, it's, he'll post at the end of the night, like, it's kind of almost like your example of a, of a successful sommelier night. It'll be all the foil and the, the corks that you've yeah. collected in your pocket yeah. throughout the night and it's like this is what i open boom yeah, and it's yeah. just like this bounty of of wines opened up and then anyone that knows a little bit about wine you like reading the course like oh what did he open oh shit man yeah, i should take i should be more realistic about it maybe do it every day and like sometimes there's not much you know <laughs> and it's, it's, it's bottles of wine i open it doesn't mean i sold them you know one of the servers sold them or, or guests just order it or you whatever. wore those pants three or days in a row there's a lot of wines that i did sell that someone else opened you know like it's just <laughs> either way it's it, still pretty it's, cool it's, it's that's in my wine. pocket yeah, yeah but that's wine it's, it's that's it's been funny. opened yeah. and consumed yeah, 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 at yeah. this no, restaurant cool. yeah. 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 i don't know if you've seen i've done it for brunch too where it's mostly like sweet and low uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I opened this packet on table twenty-seven. Yeah. Would this you is, prefer the raw the, sugar, Madame? Yeah. Um, so, but back to the story. So, but and then so you nineteen covers. You were able to build it up uh, with Matt, and then you at the helm of running service. Yeah, and Matt and I were just on the same page about so much. You know, yeah. we we both had similar backgrounds, and that um, 
we both had seen the fine dining side. Like, you know, I was at Grandma's Tavern and, and you know, Crafton Per Se for a minute. And, like, he was at the Inn at Little Washington and, like, mm. you know, these amazing places. Um, both were from New York originally, but really spent our, you know, formative years in North Carolina, you know, like, from early teenagers on. And, um, and you know, he's a, a inspiring dude and... Um, like where, really, really where, inspired me to just kind of like, you know, push the front as much as he was pushing, you know, the the, the back and the whole place and yeah. and uh, and yeah, we had, I mean we had a great team who like cared and like really wanted just like on board, right? Yeah, and um, it uh, I think it worked, you know, because well we started getting busier and we started developing like all these like loyal regular guests and you know started making friendships and like great friends out of you know people just coming in here and um you know so we've literally gotten busier every year since then okay. and it was really cool like uh i don't know if you guys follow like greg cox does his uh awards every year and like what he, he, he used to do uh he used to do it differently and this one year i guess it was 2006 it came out he had like i don't know just random things it wasn't like gold silver bronze like he does now and like best of cuisine it was like these random things but like he had a most improved restaurant and van rouge that year was the most improved and i was nice. like i've been here for exactly one year yeah. most improved you know <laughs> you will like, take you know, that i'll take it you know like, yeah you know, you know, i was thinking about like the resume at that point comeback you know, restaurant of the year yeah um and uh you know of course matt's comment was yeah i feel like the uh you know, the kid who finally made it to first base in T-ball. <laughs> <You know, like laughs> <laughs> That's great. This segment is brought to you by the Triangle Wine Company. Visit Triangle Wine Company stores in Morrisville, Cary, and Southern Pines, North Carolina. Or order your wine and beer online at trianglewineco.com. And be sure to use our promo code NCFB to receive 10% off your purchases. Triangle Wine Company. So what we have in front of us right now, and we've been like, my mouth is watering because we have yeah. a plate of oysters and some aged muscadet. Um, so let's talk about that, but then get into more of the other aged stuff you do at the other yeah. places. So I guess, you know, getting into to the aged stuff, like muscadet is, is responsible for that. Yeah. Um, you know, I always have this idea that like, you know, older wine is cooler, right? You know, yeah. and, uh, we, you know, we all know like the, the attributes of, of some maturity, but I was in New York uh, for a uh, portfolio tasting for Louis Dresner selections. Mm -hmm. And this was probably in 2006 or 7. Um, and we're tasting, you know, through their portfolio. And, and, and at the table, there's uh, Pierre Marie uh, uh, Luna Pepin and, and, and his wife Marie um, from Luna Pepin. And they've got like this table full of muscadets, and it was all one cuvee, the El Dor. But I was like, what the heck is all this? It went back to 1976. Hmm. And I was just like, well, I don't, I don't even understand. Like, to me, like, Muscadet, I already was a fan of Muscadet. Yeah. Right? I always lo already loved Muscadet and oysters. And, but it was young and fresh and crisp and, you know, super minerally and, like, all these great things you can say about it. But, like, if it wasn't young and fresh, then throw it out. Right. That's the way you should be consuming it is your right. thought. Yeah. That, that was what I thought. And then here I am looking at all these muscadets and then finally starting to taste them. And my eyes just completely open. Like, it was fascinating. I remember going through, like, almost every vintage that, that they made or that they had these Eldors back to 76 and just geeking out, like, so excited. And I remember looking back at my notes, like, after getting back from the trip and going through my notes and, like, and the notes for the 89 Luna Papan Eldor, all I wrote was, needs time? <laughs> question mark that's all i wrote like like what the heck like you know and it really taught me not just about like the benefits of of aging and that the, that the fact that wines like this can age but also like vintage matters too like i learned a lot about that that day because you know the 89 needed time at least in my mind but the the 93 and the 95 didn't mm. you know right the 86 didn't um but there's something about the 89 and and you know and, and you know what is it uh, and I was, they weren't really selling much of these wines. It was just like showing people like what, age you know, what age muscadet can be. And, and you can't just 
decide I'm going to age muscadet and age it. You, it has to be, you know, everything has to be done right in the vineyards, right? You, the, the vines have to go, you know, super deep. So there's lots of concentration and, and you know, you've got to be pruning right. You've got to do everything right. And then, and then the time on the lease matters a lot. And some of these, like the 76, I think they said it's been about a decade on the lease. It's <laughs> crazy. Before wow. they even bottle? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy, right? That's insane. Um, so if somebody looks at a bottle that says surly, that means aged on lease. So we're talking about like serious right. aging on lease. Right. And some of these wines are aged so long on the lease that they're not even allowed to be called surly because there's like laws governing that. And I think now they've decided that uh, Muscadet aged surly has to be aged between, I think it's six months and 24 months. I could be wrong on the other side by, by a bit. But like these many are aged for 30 months, 36 months. Like I said, that one was much more than that. And they're not allowed to put Sir Lee on it. Of course, you know, a lot of them do until they get busted or whatever. Right. Um, Somebody just put the, on the wrong bottle just down the street. Yeah. They're busted. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so what is a, what is a uh, typical, just a very generic, uh, you know, dumb person out question? What am I going to get from something that has been, like, say, 10 years of age on a Muscadet than, rather than a completely young, fresh? Well, so as long as it's one of these Muscadets that are, that are made... Uh, you know, in the fashion that they, they can age, where they spend that extra time on the leaves, that they're doing everything right. Uh, they, they, they gain complexity, they, they, more layers of flavors and aromas, um, a certain kind of like richness comes out. A lot of people like start to liken it more to Chablis once there's a little bit of age on it. Um, I can kind of agree with that, but to me it's, it's its own thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, and, you know, it depends on how far you want to go with it. Like, sometimes it just, you know, just rounds it out a little bit and makes it a little less edgy, but still has that, like, inherent angular quality that you want in Muscadet. Yeah, um, and that's But then sometimes it's, it's with going to pair oysters. with oysters, yeah. And it's just, you know, the salinity, like, the iodine quality and, and all these, you know, flavors, whether they're young Muscadet or old, they're still going to go great with oysters. I think the, the, the older Muscadets... Even when they're young, the ones that can age well, they, they're, more, they're richer because of all that leaves aging mm. and all the concentration from, you know, pruning and everything. So this one is... Yeah, is what are we drinking yeah, here? What do we have? Uh, uh, this is Luna Papan Eldor. I figured, uh, you know, that's nice. really important to me. Uh, we've got several vintages on the list. Um, I think we've got, what, 15 is the current vintage. We've got some seven on there. I've got some 10 in the cob that's not on the list yet. Uh, this one's a little older. It's 99. 99. Yeah, so 19 year old Nuska Day that, uh, I don't know, I mean, what, what, what do you think? Does it, can it still go? Wow, I mean, it, it still smells, smells fresh. fresh. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it, it, it is. Yeah. It is youthful and fresh in a lot of ways. I mean, it's but it's showing some maturity. You know, it's got, you can see it's starting to, to brown a little bit, but. But it's very slightly. I mean, the color is still like a golden hue. Mm hmm. Hue. Yeah. Golden hue. <laughs> the greatest wine. Uh, I just think it, you know, picks oh, up wow. all this. There's like delicious coolness, rich, and, even like a caramel thing happening. It's coating. It's but all the minerality is still, yeah, yeah. puckering, pungent on the top. Yeah, the acidity is is what's holding it together too. Like you can't age muscadet without that acidity because it'll just fall apart. You would think that like with age, I would I would venture to guess that any type of uh, like citrus fruit that's in there would be gone, but I can still get like some, like yep. lemon oil in there. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It still it kind of pulls through. You still get that like, kind of white flower thing. And we just drank coffee right now, like idiots. I know, so, but it totally but cuts it came through, through all that. Yeah. I, I, and just to, like you say, when you age wine, so this wine is uh, arguably 19 years old at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the thing is like when a young, when a wine is young and fresh, you get, you'll get a lot of the pop of fruit and just some really nice fruity flavors. But as it ages and oxidizes a little bit, you get all those honeyed caramel, tertiary floral notes that yeah. just make this wine. That's the definition of complexity in wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. it's no longer one note. It's a couple notes. Okay, and then now we just, uh, I, I just got a little oyster liquor and put put down the oyster myself. What do we, what oysters are we having? So we've got two different North Carolina oysters here, one on the side closest to you, Matt. These are Jarrett Bay, and the ones closest to you, Max, are uh, Harker's Island. Oh, okay, cool. Cool. Uh, so did you have two? I'm sorry, I should have said that before you started. Did you grab? Oh I no, you said just one. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah we said just one. So right, switch sides. It. Yeah. Because the uh, Harker's Island, I just or, yeah, Harker's Island was on this other mm -hmm. one. That's what I just had. Mm -hmm. That's really briny, great salt content. Mm -hmm. You know, pretty pretty rich in itself. There's some of my favorite oysters anywhere. I love. Mm. 
I love turning people on to Harker's Island oysters when, you know, they're all, everyone thinks, you know, I need to drink, like, you know, oysters from the Northeast, like, you know, super cool weather, Nova Scotia, British Columbia kind of thing, Massachusetts, whatever. And I'm like, try these yeah. North Carolina oysters, like, uh, North Carolina oysters. And, like, just trust me. I think the Harker's so Island good. was less briny than the Jared. Jared Pays are actually saltier to me. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. it just depends on, yeah, because yeah, now that I've had, now that I've had them both, yeah, I'd say, yeah. like, the salt level kind of yeah. Pushed Wait, even further. You had the Harkers first. Yeah, we oh, went back. Okay, we, yeah. yeah. But they're, I think the Jared, they're saltier, but and they're delicious. But there's, there's a little less going on than, than the Harkers. And so it's interesting though with the with the pairing here with a with a with an aged Busquet A. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, like when you're when you're talking about pairing, and correct me and like lead me through this a little bit more. But uh, there are times where you want um, like same for same. You want like. Uh, high mineral content with the brininess mm-hmm. or something. They're kind of leading you down the same path. Yeah. So there's synergy. But then, yeah. then there's also the, the opposite factor, right? When you want, when you want to pair something, it's like if something is so far an extreme, then you want to balance it by kind of going extreme in the other direction. I feel yeah, like that's what's happening more with this aged muscadet, that the oysters themselves are really briny and salty. And because this muscadet is so rich and, and, and it's kind of almost viscous and full-bodied, it's kind of softened it down like that's the pairing it's yeah so and, and i think you know this this age muscadet kind of does both i think it compares and contrasts with it um you know up front it's got that you know you hit with that salinity uh and it, you know super minerality and then you know in the middle and the finish is when you start to get like all those like richer notes and everything but think about age muscadet and, and muscadets that, that are really built like this with like so much you know lees aging and and, and then real broad I, I really prefer them with shellfish and, and other seafood other than oysters. This is just something we're able to do this morning. It's 10 in the morning, you know, shuck some oysters. I love, you know, any muscadet and any oyster, pretty much I'm probably going to like it. But, like, younger, fresher muscadets with, like, specifically oysters, I kind of think you can't beat that. But, like, if you're having, like, a plateau de fuite de mer and you have not just oysters but there's richer things like lobster and crab and shrimp and, like, something, like, intense, like, clams and everything, those, ri- those older muscadets kind of work with everything more mm. whereas like the oysters and the younger muscadets are kind of you hear that anybody trying better. to get a job at Ven Rouge show up with an a, any oyster <laughs> and any muscadet on that on yeah. that interview or talk <laughs> about a pairing of, of yeah. Shelf, yeah. Shelf, yeah. Shelf, you're hired yeah. no I, that, that would work I, uh, I have to say that I, I really enjoy the Harker's uh, Harker's Bay Harker's uh, Island Harker's Island ones they were definitely like meaty and almost yeah. like Wheat, as far as oysters go, yeah, so much like going on. Say, yeah, so much going on. Yeah, but um, so so, let's talk about how you procure an age list, and and I'm just going to uh, talk about one of the coolest cool factors for all you hardcore wine geeks. Um, Michael has procured one of the deepest uh, verticals of Clorgeard, also one of the yeah. hollow grounds. It's swindling well. now, but, but yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of ways to go about, like, you asked how to procure, procure uh, a list with some, some age. Is yeah. You can go out and buy some old stuff. Yeah. Uh, like sometimes, what know, they call gray get, market or you buy sellers. Well, no, like or, I've never done that. Or, or just, you know, mm-hmm. library releases or, mm-hmm. you know, like Luna Pepin does, they will sell out of their library now. Like, yeah. I started touching on it before. Like, they weren't really selling a lot of those outdoors, and I was begging. Like, every couple of months, I would, like, ask, beg our our distributor who I was, you know, hoping was advocating for me and, and, you know, showing my enthusiasm and, and, and begging the importer who I didn't have as great a relationship now as, as a great, great relationship then as I do now. I didn't know them well, but over the years really gotten to know them and I can call Josefa and be like, you know, we want this, we want that. Um, and I was a pest. Yeah. I was like pestering him. Poor guy, like I'm like I want this '93 Eldor. That's the one I wanted. Yeah. Of all these muscadets I tried from the whatever the earliest, the, the, the most current vintage was at the time, back to the '76, which they weren't selling the '76. They just made that known right off the bat. It's, we only have it in magnums, and it's not for sale. It's just for things like this. Yeah. Um, but the other stuff really wasn't for sale either, as it turned out. Like nah, we just couldn't, we couldn't make it happen. And uh, I just kept on pestering and pestering and pestering until someday I think they're like, all right, shut this kid up. Yeah. And we got a couple of cases of the 93. Were you buying and enough then, wine 
like yeah. elsewise to oh, be yeah, like, yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. I'm buying, I'm supporting you guys well, to support yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, you know, like, I guess that's largely I how it works. That's a lesson for a, a, a wine buyer yeah. who wants to build yeah. a significant differentiator yeah. program. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I got to interject. That. This cracks me up is um, Matt, when we were both at Cafe Del Rey, there was a time uh, Cafe Del Rey was part of a large corporation. They had uh, Napa Valley Grills and all that. And I remember going up north to the corporate buying, like, Seminar. Summit, whatever it was, like all the all the buyers from all over the country met in Napa, and the corporate buyer, the head buyer, she shall remain nameless because I'm going to say something silly. She, uh, I remember her telling us all, but we were trying to have a decent list at Cafe Del Rey, but I wasn't going to buy thirty year old Bordeaux. It's like, but if I could get my hands on something that was like a, a decade old, yeah, sure, yeah. why not? Yeah. And the first thing that came out of her mouth was, everyone. We do not sell our wines. We sell our wines. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, but that's lame. Because this restaurant has legs. This restaurant's going to be here for 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. And it's already 23 years old, Cafe Del Rey is. And, yeah. But even before that, it was like, no, it's more than that. It's, like, it's almost like 30 years old. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's going to be here. It's going to be here for a while. And it's the obligation to the, to the wine director at that time to pick up things that are available whenever if the budget allows so right. that you can build on this on this yeah. you know if you didn't do that then somebody that actually knew it was worth their salt later on would have been like what happened from the years 2004 to 2008 oh right. yeah that was that one chicken shit buyer that wouldn't buy anything with any age on it so that's right. why we have nothing it's like yeah right. you gotta buy a little bit and tuck some away yeah. and hide it under a booth yeah. you know put it in places you shouldn't no but that's a great point because it's hard for some especially on the who's looking at somebody that's looking at a P&L, yeah. Uh, to understand, wait, we're going to buy something that we're not going to make profit on for X amount of years. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But and that's the thing. I mean, it's like you know, the the owners have to be on board, right? right? You know, yeah. and, um, and and the idea of you know buying older stuff is, is one way to do it, but I don't think it's the best way to do it. It's a cool way to like get you know fill in holes here and there, or sure. you get the opportunity to get something cool, you jump on it. But like, if you have the the space, you need the space and and the cash flow. In order to, to put it. some stuff away, it's great. And like an easy way to do it is, you know, you have to be patient. But like, you buy something, you don't sell it. Then you buy the same wine the next vintage, and you sell that one. Right. But you still hold on to the older one, and then your third vintage, you buy that and you sell that, and then you still then all of a sudden you've got you know, you're ready to put on something that's three vintages back, or you know, yeah. depending on how far you want to take it out. Oh. And then you, or you don't sell all of what, like let's say you get a case of yeah, you know that, that Tom Sancerre. And put- and then you sell, you know, eight bottles of that case, and then you, you know you tuck four away. On, on, on over vintages, now we've got like I could do a vertical of several vintages of that, you know, Vatons Sancerre, which is like one of my favorite wines on the planet. Yeah, and I, and I think that uh, you know, for people who don't see it or don't get it, and they're just thinking, well, my restaurant's here to make money, and I'm making like, if you're thinking about it from a a, a money making standpoint, well. Think about how differentiating a factor that is when people who really enjoy wine and also, guess what? People who really enjoy wine will spend money on wine. Mm -hmm. So that's raising check averages. And they're also going to choose a restaurant based on the coolness or the the, uh, quality of a wine list. And when you can look at a wine list and say, oh, my God, this guy's got verticals of Vatel and or Clojard, crazy Uh, Muscadet uh, verticals. It's interesting. Certainly, you know. It's not one of the, the top choices people would use to help them decide where to go eat, right? You know, people are going to, they want to well, go, but, you know, people want to go, where they love the food, where they love the ambiance, service. But then there's a group of people who, who do use that, and, and they're, they spend the most money. Exactly. You know? Well, yeah. your, your wine list uh, or your, your, your cellar is like a really, really slow-growing farm. Right. And mm. if you look at yeah. it, you're like, hey, man, by the time this stuff gets to its uh, ripeness to pick, right. uh, we're going to make some money off of it. We all know wine is a commodity and aged wine is even much more of a right. commodity. Many times aged, good aged wine has more value per ounce than gold, you know, right. and you can really make a lot of money. Like the aforementioned 2005 DRC is $20,000 roughly, give or take, uh, typically on the market. One bottle of 750 milliliters of, of juice is $20,000. It's like, yeah. holy crap, man. And, that's, and, that was something, wine. and that was something that was just made over the last 15 years you yeah. know it's like yeah. that's not something that's 40 years old it's right. like that's that's something that if you held on to and when you bought it i mean matt you could probably speak to it but when you if you were they probably would have released that in what like 09 or 10 the, the drc 05 
They would, have, uh, they would have held it like three years, maybe, or three or four years? Probably would have been released in 2007 to the regular market. Yeah. What would you have said that would have sold for as a brand new wine then? Well, that's the thing about DRC. It's so much is the unicorn because it has such a high value right away. Okay. That, but like, you know, you, can, you, you make a return. That's why, that's why so many people want to buy because you make such a return on your profit immediately. Well, and I guess we already knew that 05 was a great vintage in Burgundy uh, by the time 07 came around. Like, we knew, yeah. okay, that, this is totally. going to be a good one. But like I don't know, was it like ten thousand dollars a bottle? Was it like fifteen thousand dollars a bottle when it was brand new? Well, you're so okay. Are we talking about for a wholesale buyer? Or are we talking about for a consumer? Uh, let's say consumer. For a consumer, yeah, it would have been at least I would say probably in the ten thousand dollar range, right? I mean, DRC, DRC would have right, been right. probably. So, but I mean, five. so we're saying it it doubled in price though, ten twelve years later. If yes. it, if it's twenty, so I mean. Hey man, you want to double the price of the value of something that you have? Now, not everything's going to be DRC. No. Sometimes only you know only Mike over here at, uh, at Von Rouge is going to really get a boner for fifteen year old and twenty year old Muscadet. Just kidding, but right. but I'm saying like maybe you can't charge no. three hundred dollars for like an eighteen year old Muscadet. So it depends on who it is. But 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 someone who cares a lot about wine and ageable wine will know. Oh, I'll go to Von Rouge because Michael over there really cares about this product and then now it just kind of brings the esteem level of the restaurant all the way to the, it, yeah. it heightens the level of, of esteem of the restaurant because there's somebody that really does care about uh, curating yeah. that list and it gives us something that we're excited you know something else that we're excited to talk about which you know people really like to hear about something you're excited about yeah. totally you know yeah. Yeah. they have more fun um, I might be I might be speaking a little, I might be a little bit hyperbolic that maybe probably wasn't 10,000 at that time maybe for one bottle, per consumer. Oh, so but, well, that's that, to my point. Yeah, actually, like is four times. Yeah, it's gone four then, times yeah. up. That's yeah. insane. But anyway, you, yeah. that most that like you couldn't do that with a car. Right. Like there, sure. there are vintage well, vehicles that you know, like you can get like a a, a sixty one Ferrari Berlinetta Boxer, and that's selling for four million or so. But aside from that, you know, like you can't get a, a, a like maybe like the first year Tesla. Let's say it could have been in like oh seven oh eight. Now is it's not. It didn't double or triple or quadruple in price it's just probably actually probably decre- decreased in price yeah, depending on probably not a good analogy but right. but plenty of other commodities. but nice stuff yeah, nice, nice stuff, stuff yeah. like yeah. would do that artwork yeah I would say. but anyway so but yeah you don't and it didn't stop with muscadet obviously no. the other things but we, you know age beaujolais is something that a lot of people don't think about either and like so there's um did you build the, the cove while you were here, or it was yeah. already in place? Yeah, so this room that we're sitting in now used to be a covered patio. Okay. Um, and we built I don't remember how many years ago it was. I want to say eight years ago or so. We enclosed this space, um, and we built a cove right over... Well, I'm pointing, but you guys yeah, can't see over that. Over there. Yeah. Uh, over there. Well, for uh, people that don't yeah. know, when you walk in the back dining room, it's... To your left. Yeah. And it was a, a space that was just kind of wasted area. It was like where we kept high chairs, like, <laughs> which we should have had them put away anyway, right? right sure. You know, like out of sight. Uh, and We're saying cave, cave. Yeah. It's a wine room. room. It's, it's, not, it's not underground. It's not actually a cave or a cave. It's But we've got a, a dope sign that says cave that well, then Matt or Giorgio or somebody found at some furniture market or something that's <laughs> like from Champagne. And nice. It's, it's legit. Um, but it... Uh, it really gave us, you know, the the space and the ability to to do it, and um, so buying, you know, Beaujolais that that could age, like the Fleury by Claude Wallet, they make several different cuvee, and their top cuvee is Griffin Marquis, and you know, it's it's a Beaujolais that you really can't drink young. It's just so tight and 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 wound up and just uh, aggressive, uh, you know, when it's really young in some vintages. Um, so we just kind of put that away, and I've got the 2010 on the list right now. Nice. Uh, and but you know we've got every vintage. We didn't have 11. I think somehow 11s didn't come to North Carolina. Um, but we've got like 10, 12, 13, 14. I think 15 now. Uh, in the cob, anyone wants to do vertical that way and like geek out on age Beaujolais, and it's you know if you buy Beaujolais because they're forty dollars, then maybe this one isn't for you. Yeah. It's closer to a hundred, but. Uh, it's one of those Beaujolais that acts more like, you know, Burgundy. And, yeah, you know, and they, they start but, to go P-note, I think, is the... Well, if you're, but if you're comparing, say, a $100 relatively young uh, 
burgundy, like a Pinot Noir burgundy, as opposed to a couple of years old with like a 10 year old Beaujolais yeah. in the same price range. That's a good argument. Yeah. Then, then you start justifying and say, hey, man, you know, yes, you could try a young Pinot Noir based burgundy or let's do let's do a Beaujolais that's got a little yeah. time on it yeah. and, and try to you know find something different for you. And then you're all economically you're talking about the same bottle. Right. Or just split the difference and get some past two crown. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but we anyway, just sold our last Marquis d'Angerville recently the other day. Oh, yeah. good. Good. Yeah. Uh, more to come next minute. Good. Um, I could geek speak here about vintages and all wines, but uh, it did, you didn't stop it with just wine or Muscadet or Beaujolais. Um, you extended that idea to having some aged bottles of uh, sherry over at Mateo's. Yeah, so well, sherry, I mean, ages itself. Right. Well, I mean, true. You know, uh, it depends on what you know which cherries you go with. Like we've got some over there um, by Maestro Sierra um, that you know they started making barrels for the big sherry houses back in 1830, wow. and still use some of those barrels. And you know, not long after that, um, the the Cooper was like, well, I, actually, I should start making my own sherry and whatever. And they and he started doing that and. Um, They've got sherry that, you know, some of it might go back that far in the Solera, like bits, you know, bits of it. Yeah. Uh, but we know that, like, the, the, the Montiato 1830 that we have there, it's not actually from 1830, um, just, you know, honoring that, that, that their, their beginnings. But, like, it's at least 50 years old. Yeah. And it sat dormant, yeah. you know, for that long. And they've got an old Pedro Jimenez and, and old Olorosos that, that go back at least that far. And, and, you know, some of them we think that they could be, like, 100 years old because... Uh, the alcohol content is really high in them compared to other Olorosos, right? It's it's nineteen or, or over twenty percent. Back when they used to, about a hundred years ago, that's how they were making them. They wanted them to be more like brandy, mm. and now they're they're lower. They're they're eighteen percent or whatever, not not over, yeah. not over twenty. Explain really uh, sherry one hundred and one for people in terms of sherry's age, fortified wine aged in the Solera, and if you could just explain the Solera. Yeah, so it's it's uh, like fractional blending, right? Where they're uh, blend. The most simple way to put it is blending several vintages together. Where when you take, you, you get you know fresh wine, you put it in a barrel. You take that much wine out and put it in the barrels below it. If you think of like a pyramid, mm-hmm. um, it actually doesn't work pyramid shaped as it turns out when you go there and you're oh, looking. Really? Yeah, no, it's it's. Oh, it, I always there's like some over here, and some over here. Yeah, um, I mean, there's little just mini conceptually. So, it's a, yeah, it's but because pyramid. some of them are so big that they it, it couldn't couldn't go up that high. Okay, yet, right. So they they spread it out. Um, so it's several, you know, three or four uh, levels, uh, rows of barrels spread out over the, the bodega. Gotcha. Um, but so they're, they're, they'll put that amount from you know, the new wine into a barrel, take that amount, suck that amount, that amount out, put it in the next row, and so on. So you're always getting the, some of the old wine. Yeah. In, in every bottle, it's and like it's a way like a to, sourdough starter. Or so when they yeah. say this starter is uh, sixty years old, right? Because sixty years ago they started it, and then they every day they're adding a little bit right. to it, and so it's it, it never the, the well never dried somewhere. up, right? Yeah, right. there's always something in it's there. just like that, um, and uh, it's a way that they can get a house style, like you hear, like like you know, non vintage champagne, right? Where they yeah. they're, they're going for their house style, maybe not like a little grower, but like a a bigger house. So um, erratic vintages, yeah. whether they be arguably good or bad or yeah. just uh, extreme in a flavor, soften uh, to the one style of, of flavor because of the multi Right, right. And then this is a way that they can also release the wine several times a year. It's not just every vintage, right? So, like, so certain cherries might only be released one time a year, but they could be released, you know, four or five times a year, maybe more. Yeah. Um, and But so vintage sherry is, is a pretty rare thing. We do have some at Mateo. Got some like 1970, 1975, um, and they're cool. And they're delicious. Uh, the, there's a little less complexity, uh, arguably, in a wine that all comes from from one vintage, but a little more singularity and like, you know, interest from like what was going on then in 1970, right? Right. Um, but you don't see them as much, mm. uh, and not because it's it's so rare and like unicorny. It's just they don't really do it much because. Why would it's they? not? They it's a, not what they do, right? It's, not what it's they just do. like you don't see vintage champagne yeah. as much, yeah. Though, yeah. More than yeah. cherry. But. Funny story about uh, a vintage bottle, though. Uh, we were tasting. We did a, a tasting at Mateo with the cellar master from Bodegas Tradition, one of the the, the high end 
uh, bodegas and, and sherry. And he was releasing his Fino sherry to the world in a few different cities. I think he did like New York, DC and Durham or something like that. New York, LA and Durham. And, um, so we did, you know, he invited a bunch of buyers and we, we did a little thing upstairs at Mateo and, uh, and he picked up on, you know, I guess he they chose Durham because Mateo was there, I think. And, you know, we're already, yeah. you know, I was, was going to say that you know, if you yeah, hadn't said it. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I mean, there, uh, you know, people were saying that we were selling more sherry than anybody in the country. Yeah. And people still say we sell more sherry than anybody in the country. And it, it's hard to believe because, you know, we, we, I haven't really counted up our sherries. I don't know, 30 or so sherries and t- over 20 of them by the glass. But you could uh, almost use the Matt yeah. Catley scenario of the T-baller hitting a yeah, yeah, single yeah. again right. because who else is selling right. sherry in, in, in the a, United in States? In a big week, you know, we, we're we selling, you know, three and a half cases of sherry. Normal is like two cases, three cases of sherry. Enormous. But like there's yeah. one red Rioja that we buy more of than that every week. Just yeah. one of our, you know, y- yeah. several Riojas, right? You yeah. know? And it's, it's kind of crazy to think about, but I've talked to people around the country. I'm like, yo, like, no, you sell wine to this place in, you know, in Boston. That's, you know, it's a sherry place. How much are they buying? And I'm like, well, you know, they buy a lot. I'm like, all right, well, like, we're like, like two, three lot? cases. Like, oh, no, no, nowhere close. I'm like, yeah. I don't understand. Like, yeah. You know, so I would say, when they say sherry's picking up, you know, and well, sherry's catching on, like, it's not. I feel like. <laughs> In a, in a real sense, you know, I mean, even like, if it like eight hundred percent increase, right. it still would just be a blip. Yeah, 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 I feel like sherry and rum are on the same trajectory. <laughs> Although maybe rum is finally Syrah's there too. Yes, yeah, it's, right. it's all like, Syrah, sherry, and rum. Let's just open a restaurant that only sells those three. Syrah, sherry, and rum. Yeah, SSR. Mm. That'd be a good idea. Yeah, because yeah. um, they're always the thing that are on the rise. It's a someday, and all the people that are in the know tend to really love yeah. those things. Yeah. But the mass public doesn't really get it, and they're like, eh. and yeah, all the. All the creators are like, oh, we're going to ramp up our rum production. Yeah. We're going to ramp up our sherry production, our, our Syrah production. And yeah, pe- yeah. And people like Fred Minnick writes books about it. <laughs> Talia Baloki wrote the book, right? Did she write a sherry Gretchen, book? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, she, she, like, she lists Mateo in that book as like a place to buy sherry, I think. Oh, totally. yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't yeah. Alton Brown say that uh, Mateo is the greatest tapas restaurant in all of the United States? Alton Brown, yeah. He, yeah, he, he did. Uh, like, on Instagram, he said it's the best. Top is bar in the country. Not that connects to Sherry, but it's just but defining yeah, yeah. that Mateo has a yeah. pretty important he, presence yeah. in, the, in he, the country. He really liked one of our sangrias, the cheer wine sangria. Oh. Yeah, he put it on his blog. He said it's one of the he recreated a recipe as close as he could get it in his mind. I wish he just like called and asked, but like he recreated it and he said <laughs> it's one of I one of those ideas that's so smart it kills me to have not come up with it myself. Yeah. Those and are I the best like, ones. That's a nice compliment. Yeah. yeah. You know, I just, still, you know the, the idea of the restaurant, you know, it was like uh, Southern Heart uh, or Spanish Heart Southern Soul excuse me mm. it was like the tagline that like, Matt came up with at the beginning and like that kind of like I'm like alright so let's how do I like take advantage of that like cocktails and things like that and, and doing a s- cheer wine sangria I think did that we did a cheer wine sangria and the sweet tea sangria and it's like I think those are Spanish Heart Southern Soul right you know I wasn't sure if I was going to get into this and we'll figure out like how this works in but I think it's apropos um, so there was a time before St. James was open uh, that potentially I might have worked for you guys. Yeah. And uh, so so it's interesting. There was a time when I was still at, at Midtown Grill and I was kind of looking around to do things and my name got passed around and I raised my hand and an application might have been submitted via email and uh, I get a call from Matt Kelly and he's like, yeah, let's talk. You want to come work for me? Yeah, cool. So then we had a few interviews uh, of which you were in, uh, I believe the first interview. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's one question I got to get to at one point that always makes me laugh lo and behold i pulled out and that was only because i believe the uh, the build out for st james had just taken extremely long oh man and, it took forever like and I-, I was without job at, at a certain point because i kind of was like well i want to move on from midtown i want to do something else i kind of thought that like this was going to happen sooner than it was and then it didn't and then i just said shoot well i can't be without pay for like eight yeah, months I, I ten months you, so I took the job at Standard Foods, and uh, and that was still a really cool experience, short-lived, and RIP Standard Foods. Uh, hmm. I believe the, That's right. the Standard Foods that I knew and loved, uh, it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but anyhow, and I do remember having a conversation with Matt Kelly uh, in Mothers and Sons before, uh, like, at lunchtime before, every, before it was open, you know, um, and I just went, hey, Matt, uh, I got to tell you, I think, I think I'm going to... 
declined the offer to be the GM at St. James because I need to get Cause a job. Because it's not Cause close? Because it's like, yeah, it's like yeah. 10 months away and I yeah. need to get paid. And he's like, oh, okay, man, cool. Dude, like, whatever, man. Like, do, it, do what makes you happy and, you know, I support you 100%. And he's like, but by the way, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to be the GM over at Standard Foods. To which he just went, okay, uh, good luck, man. And I uh, wish you all the best. But during that time, before uh, before I didn't work for you guys, uh, and I was work, I was going to work with you. You and I had met a couple times, and we had like a lunch at Rue Claire. Yeah. By the way, you gave me the greatest sage advice of how to eat mussels and. Oh, what I do? Uh, we oh, had, open them, shuck them off first, and then. Yeah, mussels and 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 new, um, was it spaghetti and mussels that we had, or whatever it was we had, linguine and mussels. Uh, uh, mussels mus- and French fries, probably. Oh, I'm sorry. It was a cl- clams. It was clams and, 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 and linguine. You shucked them all, took all the shells out, and then yeah, yeah. tossed it all again. You're like, yeah. there. Let's get all these shells out. And, like, muscles. Yeah, yeah, and then get muscles. into it. I was like, oh, what a brilliant idea. I never would have done that. I'm yeah. always like shucking as I go and like, you, you know, whatever. Yeah, my wife like, still gives me shit for that. I, it's just something weird. I no, do. But I, it's the smart way to do it, right? Yeah, I don't I know why I want to deal with the shells. I want to like get, them out of, get the hard work out of the way. And then, and, then, and then, yeah. Yeah. And then roll the sleeves up and get into it. I think the problem is it like encourages like speed eating, right? Like you're just, uh, you're doing all this so you don't have to like slow down, which is <laughs> not <laughs> the, the right way to do it, right? Like, so don't, maybe don't do it. Maybe you go one at a time. Put no, your fork down. do it. I yeah. still, say, still do it, but maybe like, yeah, put your fork down in between. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but one of the things, the reason I bring this up is, um, so you and I, we're, we're going to uh, work on the, the wine program together. Yeah. And that was like the, the idea. For St. James. For St. James. And so I have a pretty good knowledge of wine, but I'm not to the level of where you're at. And, and you've been doing it for a long time. But what, uh, what I really loved and I appreciated was something that you brought to the table at that point. You said... How about this, Max? When we do this program, uh, most of my knowledge comes from the old world, and you're from California, and you know a lot about that. To be honest, I don't know too much about domestic wine because I spend most of my time thinking about old world. So how about, since this menu for St. James is going to be a collection of all wines, why don't you take on new world and I'll do old world? I thought, well, that's such an awesome, uh, easy way with like kind of like a very light line drawn in the sand uh, just to uh, divide divide powers and responsibilities. And I was like, yeah, then that totally re- relieves me of knowing all the crazy old right. vintages of things. But then as we were discussing even further, you were like, when we started thinking about names and, and people that we would work with and all, you're like, I just want this to be a list that you're not going to find everywhere. And I want it. I want to, I want to work for the guest a little bit. Like I want to bring some things to the table that, uh, that hopefully people haven't seen. And let's, let's push on our, on our distributors a little bit to get, a, get us some of the things that uh, that they wouldn't that our guests wouldn't normally see, and so I think you've done a really good job of doing that. And I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, but that kind of is the the thought process of all the restaurants of of, of you know to be uh, thoughtful, mindful about like bringing some mm, unique flavors or right. some well, maybe esoteric labels. I mean, to me, it's always important to find a balance between wines that are recognizable, whether it's recognizable by the, the grape that they're made of or the, 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 the vigneron or the, the grower or the producer that made them or where they're from. Like here, you know, like everybody knows Bordeaux, right? And, uh, well, many people, most people know Bordeaux, you know, going out to eat or at least have heard of it. And like, oh, Bordeaux, like that's, you know, and I can just order that. And if, I, if not, and people aren't comfortable with like speaking up and, and asking for help or, or, you know, giving us the clues that, you know, they're ready to have a conversation about wine. Like it's safe for them to order something like that, yeah. you know? And so I think it's important to have a lot of safe wines like that on the list. You know, they need to be delicious food, friendly wines that fit with your ideals and, and, you know, still, you know, work, let, you know, let you keep that your integrity, but they also, it's a lot more fun and, and interesting for, for guests and staff and the person making the list to have, to, to push it a little bit more yeah. and have things like, I don't know, a little, little bit more oddball. And, and, and that, that what's a little bit more oddball or out of the box or esoteric, like that's, that changes all the time, right? Because people are learning so much about wine. Like, like Matt, you've mentioned it. Like you found around here people are into like the weirder the better. Yeah, right? totally. And that, I think there's, that's true for a lot of people. But there's a lot of people who like really take a lot of comfort in knowing like, okay, 
there's there's you know Ramy Chardonnay on the list here or something yeah. like that. There's yeah, it's definitely uh, venue specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, like to me, Muscadet isn't esoteric, but I guess it. it but it is. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just you know I'm a nerd. Uh, you it's know. esoteric if you yeah. go to P.F. Chang's. Right. But no, no slide on them. But yeah. that's just not their style of food or wine. Yeah. So, but it makes sense. But if you're going to a bunch of French restaurants, it's probably much more applicable. Or oyster houses or oyster places. Yeah. 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 It just depends on yeah your venue. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But 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 and and you've even taken that further out of wine into doing like here you have some uh, back or really old chartreuse. Yeah, we finally sold through that. Um, but yeah, we you know we're able to lucky enough to get our hands on some. Uh, sh- chartreuse uh, Verret the Green uh, yeah. from the um, the, f- the first um, batch of wines like from the, when they first moved to where they're they're making it now you know they've been uh, in and out of exile around France and Spain you know for hundreds of years the monks yeah the, the Carthusian monks um, and now they're they're making it in uh, uh, Varan uh, near or in Savoie and they started making their their chartreuse there in the sixties, mid sixties, like sixty four or so. And we were able to get this bottle from from that era. How were you able to get that bottle? Uh, one of our uh, wine purveyors is also uh, into liquor, sells liquor to the to the state, so we can buy it. Um, just does like special order stuff and like geeks out and finds like yeah. super cool weird stuff. And was like, yo, if I can find some some old old stuff for you into it i'm like well yeah and that's really how it all started with you know the the old um fair nats at at mothers and sons yeah because you influenced louise over there yeah yeah and and she just ran with it man like you know it's something that like you know john and i had talked about um quite a bit and he's like i can get this and that and he's like he became like super into himself john mccarthy McCarthy. yeah yeah yeah. procures a lot of these yeah 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 so he's he's the one who, who who made it happen but like Louise and, and Nathan uh, Cisco, the GM at Mothers and Sons, um, just ran with it. Like I, I take like no credit for that, other than being like, "Yeah, do it." Yeah, you know. And you know, Matt was like, "Yeah, do it," and you can spend next amount of thousands of dollars to do it. You know, like, and uh, but they just crushed it. You know, it made a super cool list. Yeah. Like, and I, you know, when when I started working with you know with with Nate over there long before Mothers and Sons opened, Matt was like, you know, show him the good path and let him walk it. And, and, and he I love that. carves his path and, you know, he, he, there's a, a good path that he's walking down and then, and carves it out himself too. And, yeah. uh, he, he knocks it out of the park. All right. Before we, uh, cause this ended up being the longest interview of all time. So, um, but I, I gotta, about that. <laughs> uh, before we, uh, I get cut out the part about my underpants. <laughs> that's the that's the tagline. That's, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I gotta ask. So going back to my interview, we were at the top floor, uh, the, the the private room at Mateo. It was you, it was me, it was Matt, Kelly, and uh, I believe Mary was there. Yeah. Uh, Sam, Sam yeah. was there. So it was like me interviewing like uh, for this panel of people, which was uh, a little intimidating uh, for one. Matt Kelly, Chef Kelly, asked me a question at the very end, and I had no idea what the hell this was. I know, meant. I remember. And I, I, got I, mean, it. I remember the, the, the question, which was like, wow. And I remember the, well, the stumble of the answer. Oh, uh, please, you tell it in your words, then. I want to hear nah, it. No, he, he said, How do you clean a. Well, I don't remember the exact How would you clean this table? How would you, table? Clean, clean, this table? How would you clean, clean this table? And, and just, you know, that's Matt's way. It's not going to, you're not, it's not going to be your regular interview. You know, <laughs> so, well, how did I respond? Uh, I don't know. You you were just grabbing and reaching, and and probably instead of going to your instincts on how you clean a table, you'd like try to come up with like a way, like I don't know, like uh, that. Yeah. That's great because I do know I was fumbling a little bit. I think ultimately I said it's something we talked about. He's like, he, I mean, it wasn't like, yo, man, this dude said he was going to clean a table like this and that, but. No, it was like no, no, we never talked about that or anything. Like you know, after you left, like yo, 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 yo it's gone. Up. Like that guy can't, you know, <laughs> you know, or he knocked that part out of the park, you know. This, <laughs> right. yeah. But like, what a crazy because we talked about legit, obvious, basic stuff that like a GM would need to know how to do and what my skill set was and where I'd come from and things I had done, what my responsibilities were. But then at the very end, he's like, "So, um, all right, cool, man. I think we're done here. So, last question. Um, how would you clean this table? Yeah, and those tables, you know, they're like, you know." It's, Old, uh, 
you know, reclaimed wood and there's nooks and crannies and you know it's yeah so was that like, like a the, real, it's like a the, like a real thing i guess right so was that the home run answer like oh well this table is obviously very old so you have to clean it very carefully or like treat it or uh, was that the this, well, or you, you guys get mad on here and you ask him yeah. the way i remembered the story was that it definitely threw me for, for a loop so like i didn't know what to say at first because i'm like oh shit this is one of those like defining moments if i say the wrong thing i might not get this job based off this whole thing and i laughed that you, michael your perspective is that i was fumbling trying to figure it out because yeah i was like oh um okay yeah i would i would get a sanitized towel uh and i would uh, i'd wipe it down i'd make sure i do hey, it but when i say you're fumbling is it was the only moment that you had like a brief loss for words, yeah. right? Because you had a lot to say about everything, right? That, no. interview, that interview lasted a long time. That's <laughs> a lot to say? You had, you, had, you had really long answers, right? But this answer was like, <laughs> you you were digging for words. And that was, it was obvious. It was an <laughs> obvious contrast to, to the rest of your answers. Like, I knew what I was talking about almost to a fault for everything else before. Yeah, yeah no, you had a lot one. to say. Like, you got, uh, you know, great experiences. Someone like that. Yeah, it, it wasn't That's like you were bullshitting. You just had a lot to say and a lot yeah. of cool stuff to say. It was fascinating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we should put a mic in front of me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, sure. Think about finally got talking finally for a living. Ch- yeah. <laughs> but uh, finally no, focused that energy. That oh, that cracked me up. And I've ever just tell I've ever told that to my wife on the, in the car. I go, Mary, and he asked me how to clean the fucking table. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Wipe it down. I'm like, but I didn't say it like that. I was like, boo, boo. <laughs> Long ago, there were tables <laughs> that were dirty. I would love to ask Matt what was the thing behind that question. Like, what would have been the perfect answer? And it was like, just to see if you would have gotten a, like a busboy to do it or you would have done it yourself. Like, was that the. Was that I don't know. The was it more were, just to throw me for a uh, loop? And, yeah. and it wasn't something like I've thought about since then. But like, once, once you said there's a thing I've got to ask, I'm like, I bet you he's talking about that last. Oh, that's cool that you question. knew that. Yeah. Because you hadn't seen Had you him asked that question before? No, no, no. That's I mean, not I, a common question he asks in interviews. No, and I, and, and I don't remember actually being in on a, another interview for GM with him at the same time. Like I've you know conducted interviews with people he's you know yeah. thinking about or have hired. You know, so many of them have just worked with us, right? I've been my assistant manager, our assistant manager here, and then you're promoted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would have been probably one of the first guys that didn't come from the camp, right? Like I would have been. Like you would have been an outsider coming in. I guess you no. Know, Eamon had already been at Mateo at that point, I think. Yeah. Um, but he, like he's someone I met on like that wine trip in 2011 to Spain with Andre. Yes. Um, but I like so, that but, though. The bat brought his whole team of people that he very much appreciated their opinion to be in that room because yeah. had I be, been the GM of a, a, a very important property to the to the empire, you kind of. You want to make sure everybody on the team is on board with this guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, no, it's important. I guess I didn't totally fumble it up completely. No, I mean, you got offered, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I was on yeah. the team. So let it go, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, right. But I had those moments. Um, as a matter of fact, when I interviewed... <laughs> I, and you I'll, can sleep better I, tonight. I still don't that. know the answer to this question. Maybe you can help me with this. When I interviewed, uh, I had been back in New York, but I was looking to come back to LA for a short time, and I was interviewing at BLT Los Angeles. Yeah. And the guy asked me, and I still don't know what he wanted. He said, let's say we give you the job. What's the first thing you do as wine director? First thing. And so I probably did the same thing, and I fumbled, and I was like, uh, I'd probably do an inventory, find out what we got, you know, think about uh, how the program's looking, see where, you know, where we can cut some fat. He's like, no, 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 but the very, very first thing you do. And I'm just like, tell my wife I got the job. <laughs> yeah. I, I still, I can't for the life of me figure out what he That's was That's interesting. At. Like, maybe I just say, uh, I walk in the door. I don't introduce, know if you just try to get to the bare bones. I introduce can't yourself. figure that one out. Hi, I'm Matt. I yeah. don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, maybe I that was like, oh, introduce myself to the chef. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I, you know, I, I would like, I think that that would be the best answer is just to say, uh, open the door to the building. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's what he wants to know. Is like, Left I want it foot first, or yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> Swallow, <laughs> blink. <laughs> Swallow, blink. <laughs> Digest Breathe. some food. Well, how about on Instagram when you guys hear that question? You write in, what was, he, what was the right answer? What would be the first thing you do? Yeah. Well, the last thing that we're going to do on the show oh, today. Yeah. Is the thing that we said we we're going to do is the first thing on the show we didn't do. Things get reversed in time all the time on yeah. the podcast. But uh, but we are super excited because this is now a even more bountiful gift bag than ever. 
Oh my gosh. Uh, you were the first recipient to receive new and improved uh, items from new, uh, new sponsors on our team. Uh, for the NCFMB gift bag, so Michael what here. An honor. Thank you so much. Holy moly! Yeah, so we got some, a heavy bag. Yeah, we got some great stuff in there. Uh, so, I think that you'll enjoy. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, some of the ones that you've known and loved and guests have heard before: are Social House uh, Vodka, Social House Vodka, yeah, made in great cool. in North Carolina. Uh, uh, Larry's Coffee Larry's Beans. Larry's Coffee, all right. That's a uh, 42 and Lawrence special blend uh, they roasted for you. Ah, I've, I've you, been intrigued by these. You know Annabelle Commissar. Yeah, exactly. You've probably met her before, but uh, that's her Michael's English Muffins. They are delicious. Uh, now there, what you have in your hand is a brand new one. Uh, Hungry Harvest, who's a recent guest on the show. They actually uh, are the, the episode that's out right now uh, while we're taping this one. Uh, they have just come on. They're a fantastic produce company selling... Um, Food that would have previously gone to waste, yeah. and uh, and and that's awesome. seizing it, finding it, and finding a home for it. That's uh, really with great. a delivery service. So what you have there is a, a T-shirt, of course, that you can wear. Uh, but also, uh, most important, inside there, there's a little card, oh. and that will get you your first box for free uh, sent to your house. I believe it's like twelve pounds of vegetables and fruits. Cool. Please wow. do it. You and Gwen will love it. Yeah, yeah that's super cool. Will love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's delicious uh, we stuff. Absolutely will. Thank you. And yeah. also for anybody that's else really that wants to get onto the Hungry Har- Harvest food delivery subscription service, you can also use our promo code NCFB, and you will receive five dollars off your first order. Yeah, wow. and then now you of course have uh, you know this well. Oh, I love it. Ms. Jordan Salsita with her wine spritz, yeah. the uh, grapefruit wine spritz. Ramona wine cooler. I picked up some of this the other day and took it out. My daughter was in a, a horse show. Oh. And uh, it was our first time being like spectators at a horse show. And we're like, can you drink? You know, what's the etiquette? We're asking like the judge of the show. Like, so what's the etiquette? She's like, it's somewhere between like golf and basketball. We're like, huh. can we drink? She's like, yeah, yeah, of course. I'm going to have some with you. Wine you know? spritz so, sounds like a perfect so, application. So, yeah, yeah Ramona. Uh, yeah. And, no, and and for the pre- people who frowned upon, they wouldn't even know that you were drinking. Yeah, exactly. And we, after all well, of your... Well, they knew we'd buy the, uh, the 40-ounce rosé we brought. <laughs> oh, nice. Ooh. Well, to, to match nicely with your uh, your Social House Vodka, right? uh, previous guest of the show and also friend of the get, friend of the show, uh, Shannon Healy and Rob Mariani from Alley 26 have provided us with their tonic syrup. Uh, so you can make some great tonic. And then awesome. after you've had all of those, or maybe before, or just before you <laughs> decide to drink, pop a couple of happy hour vitamins. They will, uh, they will ensure that you don't have such a horrible, sluggish hangover the next morning. That's procured by a, a gentleman from your old neck of the woods, Ben Shaw from Wilmington. Oh, wow. And uh, he created those. He was a former bartender himself and put together a great vitamin pack that makes you feel good while you're drinking. That's so. hysterical. That's awesome. You'll also get a, there's a shirt from us. Oh, wow. So, uh, Odd swag. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. That's quite a, quite a gift bag. And yeah. thank you to all the, the sponsors there. Yeah, really, they're, really they're super awesome. We love working cool with stuff. everybody. So thank you again to everybody that helps and contribute. And if you ever want to be a part of the gift bag, you know how to reach us. Go get us at uh, max or matt at ncfbpodcast.com. Matt, what else do we got here? Well, uh, Michael, I think we all this conversation has validated who you are and right. let people who don't know who you are who you are so uh, thank you for spending the time with us this morning oh, it's yeah. an honor thanks for thanks for uh, having me on thanks for making the trip out here it's, uh, it's really awesome we'd love to be on Mocow so uh, for all of you out there who want to know more go to Mateos go to Van Rouge go to St. James and go to Mother's and Sons and you will eat and drink very merrily Guests of the NC f and podcast receive a swag bag, including gifts from these exceptional North Carolina producers. Social House Vodka, Hungry Harvest, Alley 26 Tonic Syrup, Michael's English Muffins, Larry's Beans and 42 and Lawrence, Ramona Wine Coolers, and Happy Hour Vitamins. Thanks for listening to the NC f and podcast. I am the voice, Brian Hoyle. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged.